Okay, good evening, everybody. I uh, appreciate your flexibility in the starting time of our class tonight, but we're not gonna be too long tonight, uh, but just wrap up some final points of our uh, personal money management class and um, and call it a, call it a, a, a session, and that's good for you guys. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, I'm recording this class because we have one student who cannot make it tonight, so it'll be posted to Blackboard tomorrow. And tonight, our subject on our last class for this summer session of personal money management is about taxation, one of the evils of making money in, in our society is you have to pay taxes. And we'll be talking about that, looking at some examples of that. And then we'll be talking about uh, the project paper. Uh, if you have any last minute questions on that, it uh, be prior to you posting it, but some people have already have posted their work. And then I'm going to ask you to do one thing, and, and that is to update your portfolio and, and post it to uh, the discussion forum. And I'll go over that in a few minutes. But I'd like you to update your portfolio as of July 29th. Uh, that's Friday. Update your portfolio, and we'll walk through that a little bit later. But uh, if you want to earn some extra credit points for our class, that's uh, what I would like you to do is to get uh, to get 10 additional extra credit points added to your project paper if you complete your portfolio and post it uh, with the correct information. Uh, I will give you 10 extra credit points on your paper to make your grade even sweeter uh, for this summer. <clears throat> so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's make sure we got things organized here. Let's bring this up. Just it's the, you know I'm going to be a little punchy tonight. This is near my bedtime, so I'm going to be really uh, out of it in about a half hour. So let's let's get the show on the road here. All right, um, let's see, because I am one old gangster. Um, let's see. Oh, that's not what I want. That's what I want. There we go. Okay. All right. This is our Blackboard. I just want to go over a couple last minute things. When you um, you post your work to the, uh, oops, that's the wrong one. You post your work to the project paper, uh, post it to this file folder when you're done, and I will review it and, and give you your grade and close out the course. Uh, I'm going to ask you, as I just mentioned, to update your portfolio. And I would like you to post that to the uh, class five questions and comments section when you're all done. So you'll just update your portfolio as of July 29th, find out whether you made or lost any money and also get the values of the indexes. And let's compare what your performance was to the indexes. And I'm gonna bring that up right now what I would like you to look at it and I will post a sample of this to this discussion forum for class five after class. But let me just bring this up. One moment. I had a, <clears throat> a graduation to go to tonight and uh, it ended at 7.45 and I just got home. So I'm a little bit unorganized here. So I apologize. <laughs> Okay. So here's the portfolio as of the last time we did evaluation on July 15th. What I would like you to do is just change this date to 7:29 and make that copy it all the way down. And then I want you to go to your stocks in your portfolio and update it as of the close of business this Friday. Remember the markets close about 1 p.m. And, uh, and then take that value and multiply it by your original shares and get your new valuation and determine what this is. And if you, it's, I think some of you have made some money in the last week or so because the market's done better. I know I have. Um, and, uh, and update that. And then calculate the new Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ as of um, Friday. 
and then that will update these numbers. And the good thing about me loading up my port this portfolio to the discussion, it'll give you all the formulas and show you how all this works, and then you can update your portfolio uh, to uh, match it. Now, again, this was not part of our original assignments, but what I'd like to do, and I do this for every class, is to, if you post this to the discussion forum, uh, with the, in a, you create a forum, post the file, I will, and if you do it correctly, I will give you uh, 10 extra credit points added to your project paper. So if you get 100 on your paper, that means you get 110. And let's say you had an 85 average coming into the last grade, you're going to get go from a B to an A in the class uh, with that 110. So this could be very uh, valuable uh, to some of us. So uh, take note of that. Again, if you don't do it, it's no big deal because it's just extra credit. If you don't want to do it, ah, the hell with this, don't do it. But also by doing this, we finally figure out who is our wolf of Wall Street for our class, who has the best return on their investment and they get a special prize. And I will send the class an email after that is done to get your mailing address. And I'll send you out a University of Laverne pennant, which there's one right behind me, but you can see it very well on the screen. And also a Starbucks coupon. I will not send you a Starbucks share of stock, but that could be a very nice prize. But I will send you a Starbucks gift card so you can have a couple of cups of coffee or whatever on uh, as a reward for your fine performance in your portfolio. So that's what I would like you to do. Again, this is extra credit work. You don't have to do it. But if you want to be included in the Wolf of Wall Street final, uh, that's what I would like to see. So that's what I want to do. Does anybody, Eva, Eva or Eunice, do you have any questions on that part of our work? Okay, good. Now, Eva, I want to tell you, uh, uh, I have Eunice coming up in another class this fall. So she gets back-to-back -back classes with Professor Hassey. So pity her. And uh, we'll have to, yeah, thumbs up. You say thumbs up now. Wait till you go to this class. And here's here's a kicker. The class doesn't start to the end of August, but we have a class this Saturday morning for the fall class. How about that one? That tells you a little bit about this class that she's getting involved with. Uh, so uh, we have our, our first class is this Saturday. And now it's voluntary, but if you don't attend, you're in big doo-doo. So uh, uh, that's that's point. So Eunice is in that class coming this fall. So it's a good class. It, she'll she'll like it all right so that's our portfolio work so let's get out of that now i'm going to show you a brief video i can find it on a definition it's kind of a fun video it's very dated but it's kind of fun as well uh, on the definition of taxation some of you might know about taxes. Some of you might not have a clue. You know, to you, taxes is, hey, what are those, what are all the money is being taken out of my paycheck? Uh, but there's a lot more than taxes than that. So we're going to watch a, a very brief video. It's three minutes that kind of defines that. And this video is in your YouTube playlist, and you can look at it later on. It's kind of a fun way of looking at taxation. So let's bring that up. While we invest part of our savings to help finance the world's most efficient business system, at the same time we pay taxes to government to finance many kinds of services which also contribute to our way of life. For example, our taxes must provide the necessary funds to improve and expand our school system. Our taxes must be sufficient to pay for city streets, health, fire, and police protection, and of course, aid to the needy. Our state taxes help pay for highways, educational institutions, and among other things, help to finance important experiments to increase the productivity of our farms. Our federal taxes pay for irrigation and reclamation projects, for national parks, postal services, 
the Weather Bureau, and many other services. Our taxes have to pay for the enormous cost of past wars and provide the funds for a defense program which will ensure the safety of our country. In addition, all of us should be willing to pay whatever taxes are necessary to enable efficient government to improve or expand any essential service. But with our present tax load, we should avoid pressuring government for any new services that aren't absolutely necessary. Because we all know the more our government provides, the more taxes it's forced to collect. None of us can escape. Big business. Small business. Farmers. Workers. Housewives and all of us have to pay our share. Demanding more and more from government could create a tax burden heavy enough to crack essential blocks in the foundation of our business system. Therefore, we shouldn't let our taxes reach a point where they destroy our ability to save and invest. For, as we have seen, our rising standard of living depends upon a constant flow of savings dollars into our business system each year. Well, welcome to 2022, the state of our taxes. And uh, that's where we stand. And that's a good definition of our taxation system is what it produces for our dollars, services, that sort of thing. But at the same time, it creates our political environments where one political party, like the Democrats, like to spend money and uh, tax uh, the wealthy to pay for it, whereas the Republican Party still likes to spend money, uh, but how they get those funds are mainly from increasing business and taking the taxes from business. And that's the nature of our political system. Now, that is a very crude and basic definition. It gets a little bit more complicated than that, but that's how it works. And so the subject of taxation involves us on a personal basis. It's our covering our fair share of our uh, schools, our roads, our, our providing services by the state government, by the state uh, city governments, by the federal governments, and it all based on your earning income power. The more you make, the more you're taxed. Current tax rates rates in America range from as high as 35% of your income to as low as 2%, 5% of your income, depending on your income level. But at the same time, there's other taxes like property taxes. It taxes you ownership of assets, namely real estate. Those property taxes go towards keeping the schools and the running of your city governments. The state sales taxes you everybody when you purchase a product at a store you buy an automobile whatever you have to pay a sales tax that sales tax goes to the state and city governments and then you pay your federal income tax and your state income tax which goes to ma ma maintain the state and federal governments it's a lot of money and it's a lot of responsibility for on you as a wage earner to pick up the tab. Our job as citizens, and I'm not going to get into political commentary, but our job as citizens is to determine the leadership of our country who determine these taxes and determine how much of our wages we get to keep or not. And that's how it all works. And it's a very important part of our planning, of our budgeting, is being able to understand taxes and it begins with our paycheck this is a sample it's dated about seven years ago but it gives, still gives us the basic i remember when i first got my paycheck i think i got my first paycheck when i was good god about 16 years old and i was all excited that i got a check and i was able to take it to the bank and deposit it and open up a checking account and blah 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 but when i got my paycheck i go what is this what's going on here Where'd all my money go, even back then? 
and that's where taxes go to. Now, one of the reasons why we are taxed is to provide us as citizens services. And that's what the, all these taxes are on this sample paycheck. Taxes for retirement, Social Security, Medicare. When you turn, it changes from year to year, but I'll, I'm just going to pick a, 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 a common num number. When you turn 65, even though you can begin claiming benefits at 62, but when you turn 65, you are now entitled to getting a monthly check for the rest of your life. And it's all based on the Social Security deductions called FICA, Federal Insurance Compensation Act. And that goes to your retirement fund. You can go to the Social Security Administration and get a statement every year and request a statement every year of telling you how much you've put in to the Social Security system and how much you can take out once you reach, once you start approving or being able to get benefits at 62, 65, the maximum age is 70. At the age of 70, that's when you max out and you have to start getting a check after age 70 every month. But also there's a very important part of Social Security called Medicare. And that's another service. Once you retire or you no longer get a paycheck from your employer, that means you're off their health insurance benefits. You do not qualify for health insurance benefits. Thus, there's Medicare. Medicare is what you've been putting in with every paycheck for your life. And when you turn 65, you get a Medicare card and you can now get insurance, health insurance funded by the federal government. Gets a little bit more complicated these days of 2022 because you can pay extra for additional services like prescription drugs, like additional hospital care, a variety of other issues, and you have to pay extra for that. But the basic Medicare services cover your health insurance. So if you're working and you get a paycheck, or if you're working for uh, the state, or if you're working for the federal government, Many times you will not get FICA deductions because they have their own system for their own employees. But FICA and Medicare and Social Security are taken out from most of our paychecks. The second major area or perhaps the greatest area of taxation is the federal taxes. As you can see it here, it's the highest amount on all these deductions. This is based on the number of withholdings you declare, and it's also based on your income. At the end of every year, December 31st, you total up all your income, you file a tax return, and you list all the federal withholding taxes you paid during the year. And if all that total of those federal withholding taxes equate to a more than what you owe the government based on your income, you get a refund. If you do not, if it does not equal that, then you have to pay a federal tax. That's a whole nother class in figuring out those taxes, but that's how it works. Underneath that, as you can see, is the California state withholding. Now, most of us who get a, who have withholdings from the California state, we get those usually back in refunds. You usually get a refund from the state. If you don't qualify for a refund from the state, it's because you own a lot of assets and you own a lot of property. But most of us get refunds from the state. Most of us, once you get an income over $70,000 a year, maybe even lower, uh, I've been a little bit out of touch with that, you have to pay federal taxes. Now, the next big, those are our taxes, okay? Those are our major taxes, retirement, Social Security, Medicare, federal withholding, state withholding, and the last one is in the state of California, it's called Supplemental Disability Insurance, SDI. If you come become disabled on your job and, and you, um, you are entitled to getting your paycheck for 18 months after your disability. After those 18 months go by, goodbye money. But this gives you a little safety net should you become disabled, this is insurance. Now, if any of you ever watch television and watch those dopey commercials with the duck that goes Aflac, <clears throat> AFLAC is another insurance agency that will 
if you get a policy with them, that covers your disability after the SDI goes out. So if you become disabled for the rest of your life, you still have, you have 18 months from the state of California. And if you get a policy for disability, in addition, it's called long-term disability, which you have to pay for, that's what those companies like Aflac fund. And you can keep getting a check for the rest of your life, but you have to purchase that type of disability and long-term disability. I highly recommend if I was a financial ma uh, consultant to, his, to a family or an individual who has a history of uh, illness, who, is lit, who works in a kind of a high stressful or injury plagued job like construction or whatever, you should get long-term disability because the likelihood or the chance or the risk of being injured on the job and disabled and never working again, you're protected by maintaining your paycheck if you purchase that long-term disability coverage. But that's a subject for financial planning. SDI is short-term financial planning. Those are the federal and state taxes that are withheld. All the rest of the withholdings, as you can see, are health insurance. This is an HMO. Blue Cross plan for this individual. This is not my paycheck, by the way. Uh, I stole this from somebody. Uh, this is your health insurance. This is your eye care vis um, vision insurance. This is called a, and this is popular these days, it's called a FSA. In other words, you can set money aside and it goes to additional health benefits, additional benefits that's tax free. And you get one of these FSA, FSA uh, supplemental uh, health insurance cards that you can use like a debit card. And then you go to the dentist, you put money into this program. And you, but the bad thing about it is you got to spend it in 12 months. You can't have it carry over if some of you might have that. I have it and it's very helpful. That's how I pay for my, a lot of my dental work. Uh, I don't have dental insurance that's offered, but our dental plan at Laverne is very poor. And so I just put money into the supplemental plan. It's, it gets tax, I get a tax break, I get a debit card and I can use that debit card when I go to the dentist uh, <clears throat> or else here. So as it's here, I'm putting $25, or this person is putting $25. Then we have long uh, life insurance. Many employers offer life insurance. In this case, the life insurance is equal to double the salary of this individual. So if this individual is making $50,000 a year by putting $6.80 in every paycheck, you can get $100,000 of a term life insurance policy. Some employers offer that, others don't. Then here it's going back to a long-term disability. University of Laverne offers the employee at the benefit of purchasing that AFLAC type of insurance I was just talking about. It's called long-term disability and this employee has decided to do that and is purchasing additional long-term disability. Then we have retirement. Since this is the uh, University of Laverne, it's a, called a not-for-profit organization. They have is what is called a 403B retirement plan. If you work for a profit-oriented company, you have a 401k plan. Uh, if you work for a church or some other type of organization, you might have a 510C, all different types. And all it means is it's putting money into a retirement plan that is invested by some investment managers and you have, can you keep this in that account? You can have, you have the ability to take it out during the course of your life, but if you take it out, you have to pay tax on it. It's better just to keep it in there, earning and growing over your lifetime. Then we decide to retire at 60, 62, 65. This along with the social security will be your monthly income that you will generate in retirement. Now, these days with inflation and high cost of living, especially in Southern California, many employees work longer than age uh, 65. They keep working. And so in that case, uh, once you hit 70, you have to start drawing on your social security, but you can keep working as long as you want. So one of the problems is, is once you start drawing social security at age 70, you have to file that as ordinary income on your tax return and pay a tax on it. <laughs> That's a bummer. But if you're still working at the age of 70, what I would do is just 
not even when you get those paychecks, put it into a tax deferred investment and you keep getting your paychecks from your, your company until you decide to officially retire. I have many friends and clients that I do tax returns for who are 75, 77 years old and they're still working. They're teaching or they're doing something. So they have to get their social security checks at age 70. What they do is they put that into a tax deferred IRA. If anybody knows what an individual retirement account is, they just put their IRA, their social security check and invest it in IRA. It's tax deferred then, and they don't have to pay tax on it. They're just investing it. And then when they decide to pull that money out, it'll be taxed at a lower rate because then they're officially retired and they can pay a lower tax. This is type of tax planning you need to think about. Most of us, especially with good health and good health insurance are gonna to wanna to keep working. Maybe quite late in life, especially if you enjoy your job, why stop? Um, I have a lot of friends that retired when they were 55 and they, they become basket cases because they have nothing to do. They can only play so much golf and go on so many dopey vacations to visit your grandkids. Uh, they become bored. So a lot of us want to keep working. And that's why I encourage all my students, especially you guys. Wait a minute, Ava and Eunice are going, wait a minute, I'm not thinking about retiring. But you're learning more skills here with your degree. You can start doing other things. Having a second income. Or when you decide to retire, you might want to try working, doing something and getting a paycheck because you've been trained and you like to do this. You can keep working. That's why I teach. I am technically retired, but I love teaching so much, so I keep doing it. Uh, and I and my retirement is, is going to be deferred until I decide to really hang them up, which will probably be in about two years. Knock on wood. I want to retire when I'm fairly healthy. Uh, so I'll probably keep teaching another two years, and then, uh, then I'll cash out. But that, these are things you have to think about. And by getting an education, and I know this is, sounds corny, but it's true. By getting an education, you're developing other skills that you can find additional work, second income, an additional career after you're done with your regular work. You can do other things and keep working. By having an education, you have skills. Keep taking courses, especially if they're cheap. Keep learning throughout your life because you're putting, you're giving yourself protection of earning another, another income or keep working in things that you might want to do. And that's a good thing to think about down the road. I know it's early for you guys, but trust me, 50, 55, age 60s comes very quickly, <laughs> very quickly. And next thing you know, whoa, ask your parents about this. Did you ever think that you would ever retire and come to this point? I had no, no idea. So you got to think about that. You got a part of personal money management is think about what you want to do. Now, if you just want to be lazy and just relax and watch TV all day and go for walks, and that's fine too. But a lot of us like to stay busy in things that we like to do. And that's something to think about. And the last deduction out of this paycheck is for parking or other things. And you, there's a whole variety of things. Uh, many organizations, many companies, especially if you work for a company in downtown Los Angeles, there's no place to park. So you're going to have to buy, pay for parking. Sometimes the companies will deduct those from your paycheck to pay for your parking pass or whatever. It happens. Not to bring up another source subject, but many times you are your wages are withheld because you maybe have child support payments. Maybe you have outstanding parking tickets, uh, have outstanding car uh, car fees, whatever. If you have any bills, the government will find you and deduct those eventually from your pay. So you got to be aware of that too. Don't think you can get away without paying a couple parking tickets. Eventually, your name's going to come up in the computer saying, "Hey." How come Rick Hassey hasn't paid these parking tickets? He owes us $1,000. Next thing you know, you get a letter saying, we're going to begin starting to deduct from your paycheck these parking tickets. Son of a gun. So you got to be careful about that. The government will do that. Or if you're having tax liens or tax problems, again, a bad subject, but don't think you, you can get away without filing a tax return for a couple of years. Don't think that you don't report income. 
eventually the government is going to find out about this and you're going to have to deduct it. So it's better to be honest now. Now, what I always tell my friends, geez, Rick, I just got a $3,000 tax bill. I can't pay it. Work. You can work out something with the IRS or the state. They All they want you is to be honest and work with them. They're not going to hassle you. But if you are in denial and not pay attention to a tax bill, eventually it's going to hit that paycheck right there. And then it's going, then it's going to be even uglier. So just be aware of that down the road. So that's the basics of all taxation is your income. Now, another basics of all taxation is naturally property taxes, naturally real estate. Any assets that you own, you're going to have to pay tax on. So let's take a look at that. We have to have tax planning strategies. Even if we only make minimum wage, even if we don't make that much money, you're still gonna have to pay tax because you're gonna pay withholding taxes. You're gonna hopefully try to get a refund. You're always gonna need to understand what your income level is, how much tax you're gonna have to pay. You should always strategize. And, plan. and if you don't do that, ask somebody. Here's one of the great things about this course. And I'm being honest with, honest with you. If you if in three years you have a tax problem or don't understand something, remember that Mr. Hassey told you, hey, send me an email, give me a call, and I will give you some advice. If I don't know the answer to it, I will point you in the right direction to get that advice. One of the best things about getting an education is you meet people in your network that you can say, oh, I remember about this class, Professor Hassey. I'm going to find out about this. You have access to information. You're not alone. That's one of the best things about getting an education. You have people now who are willing to support you. And guess what? They're not going to charge you. We've charged you enough while you're here getting an education. The rest is, the, is freebies. Don't forget that. I'm not saying that just to be think that we're cool. We I have many students who are constantly asking me questions from 15, 20 years ago. I, I tell you a funny story. I had a, a student uh, in a class last spring and I go, geez, your name's familiar. I had their father in my class 20 years ago. Talk about being, uh, talk about culture shock, holy moly. But it, again, it does it, it makes a difference being able to work with this network. My camera's going on and off tonight, so I apologize. Uh, so um, don't always think about that. Think about your, don't wait till April and say, oh, how many taxes I owe? Should always plan, and I, I, here's what I do. Every June 30th, July 1st, I take a look at my tax strategy. I take a look at how much money I've made up to this point in time this year, I pretty well know what my pay is going to be the second half of the year. It's pretty much going to be the same what it was the first half. And now I can determine, oh, I'm going to be making this much money this year. How much tax am I going to owe? And how much tax have I been withheld? I now, in July, kind of know by April if I'm going to have a tax bill or not. And usually, I, I'm going to be honest with me, I have to pay tax every year. Damn it. So I have to begin to thinking about, oh, geez, I'm going to have a big tax bill come April. I have to start planning for that, saving some money. I don't want to give that much money to the government during the year. I'll pay my tax in April. Other people want to say, you know, I want to withhold everything and then I'll get a refund. It depends on your strategy to pay. It depends on where you, how you want to do it. But tax planning is the key. All right. It's a key. Now. Tax planning involve sales taxes. You purchase something, you have to pay a tax. Taxes on you purchase or own an asset. Now, what is an asset? If you own a car that generates revenue for you, you have to pay tax on that. If you own real estate that you live in, that you own, you have to pay tax on that. If you own equipment or valuable assets that produce revenue, 
you have to pay tax on it. That's called property taxes. Then you have your taxes on wealth, which we were just talking about, your paycheck, your earnings. You even are taxed when you die. <laughs> That's why we were talking about last time about wills and estates. Make sure you don't have to burden your family if you die with taxes. Make sure you plan a will and plan accordingly. And all these taxes go to different things, as I mentioned earlier. Sales tax, they go that goes to your state and city governments to pay for police, to pay for services, to pay for uh, roads. Taxes on property, most of those property taxes go to your school district where you live. They go to pay for the schools. Only the people who own assets are paying for that. But it gives the pe people who don't pay, own, don't own property, the ability to send their children to a decent school because the citizens who own the assets in, the, in their community are paying for those services. Now, naturally, schools get also income from the state. Schools also get in from, income from the federal government. But the main source of revenue for your schools in your school district is property taxes. Now, in some cities, mainly larger cities, there's city taxes, which go for city services. But the rest of their taxes are mainly on your income and wealth. But you also pay, as I said, shows here, federal estate taxes, state inheritance tax. If somebody leaves you money, you got to pay tax. They're, they're going to get you. Because as you all know, government is big. Somebody's got to pick up the tab. If you do not, if you feel that government is too large, you vote the people who will change the tax system and reduce the size of the government. Tough these days to do that because a lot of people are dependent on the government programs and government jobs. The whole industry has been created. But this is how taxes work. So your job in your own world is to understand your taxes, especially your earnings taxes, and plan accordingly. And also keep the proper records. Everything's digital these days, but also you should keep track of everything. Look for trends. Look for, oh, my income's up this year. That's good. But oh, that's bad. I'm going to have to pay more tax. Or my income is down this year. Okay, that's bad, but I have to pay less tax. That sort of thing. If you have a second income, you are usually given a 1099 form. 1099 is for self-employment. If you have a second job or you work for somebody on the side, they have to file a 1099. 1099 income is not taxed. You pay the tax when you file the return. It's not like payroll tax. So you have to be aware of that. I had, I remember one summer when I was in college, I earned $5,000 painting houses. I was rich, but then I got my 1099 form at the end of the year and it shows I made $5,000 of income, but I didn't pay any tax. I had a huge problem when I had to file that return because I had to pay tax on that $5,000. So you have to remember if you have supplemental income or additional revenue and you get it, it's called a 1099, you have to be aware that that's going to increase your tax burden because that money is not withheld. So there's all kinds of things you have to keep track of. And here's, here's a good point that I have to make. Sometimes all this stuff becomes overwhelmed. So then you try to find people that are cheap but that you can trust that will help you and guide you through all this. That's important. Don't not be in denial. <laughs> oh, I'm, I, I, it's, like, it's like getting up in the morning and you don't want to go to work. Well, I have two options. I can put my sheet covers over my head and just hide and try to sleep. But then I'm, I'm going to lose pay or I might get fired if I don't go to work. But if you go to work, you're miserable. Oh, why am I here with working with these people? But at the same time, you're getting paid. So you don't not be in denial. Accept the responsibility as a citizen that you have to carry your fair share. And don't give me this. I, I'm going to talk politics here, and I'm not going to do that. Don't just ac be accountable for your own income. Pay your taxes and worry about. Don't worry about somebody who's because of their 
income and their resources don't have to pay taxes. That's their that's the other problem. Do not say, well, I'm not going to pay my taxes because Joe Schmo, my boss, doesn't pay taxes because he gets a lot of deductions. Well, he gets a lot of deductions because he owns assets that entitle him to deductions. If you don't own any assets, you don't get deductions. So you have to pay tax. It's just the state of the world. If you don't, you got to deal with it. And do not be in denial. If you're in denial, you're going to have a really, if you go one year without paying tax, you, your tax bill increases 30% every year with late fees and interest charges. You go two or three years without paying taxes, you basically tripled or doubled your money that you owe in that time. Do not do that. Be honest. Tell the IRS, tell the state, I don't have the money to pay. Let's work out a payment plan. Let's work out something. And they will do it because they want to get some money too. They don't want to fight you and have payroll deductions. They don't want to take you to court. They don't want to arrest you. That's that's not good public public relations. You can work with them. That's the key. But the key is to plan. The key is to develop tax strategies in this. There's a lot of people out there that will help you. Some of them will try to rip you off by expensive fees and services. If you're thinking about using a financial planner or a tax planner or an accountant, first question is, how much? How much are you charging me? Per hour, a retainer, whatever. And then you can come to Mr. Hasse and say, Mr. Hasse, this person wants to help me with my financial planning, but they're charging me uh, $75 an hour plus a retainer of $500. It's making my head spin trying to figure out how much it's going to cost me. My first thing I would tell you is you can find somebody cheaper. Stop. So be aware of that if you need help. But the nice thing about getting a business degree from any school is you now have the ability, A, to ask the correct questions, or B, do it yourself. You don't need to be in denial because you can handle it. It's not that difficult. So that's the key to taxation. Keep it simple. Don't be in denial. Accept the accountability and the responsibility of being a citizen. I know that sounds corny, but it's true. And keep records, keep receipts. If you buy an asset that's over $500, keep the receipt. Because maybe someday you need can deduct that depreciation on that asset. If you use your automobile to drive to classes, to drive to work, keep your track of your mileage. I know this sounds kind of geeky, but if you keep track of that, it adds up, you might be able to get a deduction. If you have child care, pay for child care out of your own pocket, that's a deduction, especially in the state of California. So just be aware of all this, keep records, and it can be managed. It all goes back to our very first, first and second class, planning, budgeting, Owning up to the responsibility of running your own affairs. Don't depend on your husband. Don't depend on your wife. Don't depend on your grandparents. Don't depend on your uncle. Don't depend on somebody who's looking out for your best interests. Depend on yourself and you'll be fine. Now, yes, you can have a spouse help you. You can have family help you. But it starts with you and then you go to the help, get seek help after that. That's the best advice I can give you about taxation. Okay, any questions on taxation? My final off the record comment is taxes can be one pain in the butt. But the more money you make, the bigger pain in the butt it gets. Sometimes that pain, of, like for, for example, and I'm going to tell you guys right off the bat, tomorrow evening, I'm going to be the $1 billion lotto winner of Mega Millions tomorrow evening. Just so you guys all know, I'll keep teaching, no problems. But I'm going to, now, what am I, I'm going to have some serious tax planning when I get that sucker. $1 billion lottery winner, that means I'll take home about $600 million. Yeah, well, maybe you won't ever see me again, but that's all right. But 
I'm going to have a heck of a tax problem. And with $600 million in my bank account, I'm going to go seek some help. Even if, uh, even though I know what I'm doing, that's just too much. But so, so just think about that. Just think about getting that lottery winner tomorrow night. But talk about a pain in the neck. So that happens. And as you, as you go up the food chain with your businesses, with your career, you're going to be making more money. You're going to get to the point where you make a decision of owning assets, real estate, investment. Make sure before you invest, you understand the tax consequences. Oh, I can't tell you how many times people have bought houses and they say, geez, I didn't understand how much the property taxes were on this property. I can't afford that. Why didn't you ask that question to the real estate agent or anybody when you were thinking about that property to buy a home for your family? By the way, what's the annual, what's the property taxes on this sucker before I get involved in this? That's a good, that's a good question. Know these things before you make the financial decisions. Know that when you invest in the stock market or invest in anything, if you make money on that and you cash it out, you got to pay a tax. It's called capital gain. So that's why when you invest in retirement funds, you invest in IRAs, you keep that money until you're ready to retire. Because if you have to take it out early for whatever, you're going to get nailed on taxes. <laughs> Trust me. It's kind of like you can relate to this. You ever work overtime and get paid double time or one and a half times greater? And you get your paycheck and you go, my paycheck hardly changed. Why? Because you got nailed in taxes with all that additional income. That's just like winning the lottery or buying a piece, an asset. Next thing you know, most of that goes to the government. You need to be aware of that, especially aware of that. And that's where you should ask those questions before you do those things. Doing those things is good. That's It's looking out for your future. But at the same time, it creates tax issues. And you need to be aware of that. Okay. Any more talk about taxation, I get headaches. So I'm going to move on from that. Okay, I want to talk about one last thing before I cut you loose. One of the nice things about this class and all business classes, I hope the professors that you have had, because I'm one of them, is, has explained to you that now you are part of a network. You're a network of alumni. You're a network of students. You're a colleague. Once you Grad, leave this class tonight. You are, I, I don't consider you a student unless, Unisa, you're still a student of mine because I got you in the fall. But Eva, you're not, you're, you're a colleague. You have finished your program with me. You might take me again another time, but maybe not. You're a colleague and you're entitled to being in my network. You can sign up for LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn account. It's Rick Hassey, and it has all kinds of information about finance, about jobs, about what's going on in the economy. And also it's a place where you can get recommendations and learn about business even more outside of the classroom. Remember I told you earlier, never stop learning. After you get your degree and you have to don't make, thank God you don't have to make any of those tuition payments and you, all you have to do is pay off your student loan if you got one, but never stop learning. Read the Wall Street Journal. Go to the library once in a while and read the Wall Street Journal. Watch a business channel every now and then. Keep your mind active in the economy and business because that'll help you personally planning your taxes, planning your career. Know where the trends are in business, in the economy. Don't depend on somebody telling you that. You be, be ahead of the game. I like to call that, and this is the subject of this part of the course, exit strategy. You should always in your life to run your personal financial affairs, have an exit strategy. What happens if I get laid off tomorrow for my job? Do I have an exit strategy? Well, your exit strategy was, do you have proper savings? Do you have a safety net in case you lose that income? I didn't invest any money in my life until I had three months of paychecks in the bank. Three months. 
three months. That's two, four, that's six paychecks if you get paid twice a month. That was in the bank in a savings account. So if all of a sudden something happened, a health issue in the family, I got uh, laid off, I had to lose my job, I had three months of money that I could re help me as a buffer to get through everything. Now, you think about that and go, geez, Mr. Hassey, that's a lot of money to save. In the long run, it can save your butt. Now, as you get older and you don't have that issue of maybe losing your job, you can take that three months of pay and invest it. But it's already being invested in a savings account and you're earning some interest. But here's the thing. It's savings of the future. It's an exit strategy. You should always put some money in your retirement fund. If you have extra cash at the end of the year, get an IRA, individual retirement account exit strategy. You are doing an exit strategy by taking and getting your business degree from Laverne. That's an exit strategy. You're giving yourself options in your career. When you get your degree, keep learning. Take a community college course in business or whatever. Read, read newspaper. It doesn't mean that you devote your life to economic study, but you learn and keep abreast of what's going on in the world because you're giving yourself, here we go, an exit strategy. If there's one thing that you take out of this course and somebody comes up to you and say, what did you get out of Hathi's course? I need an exit strategy. And they know exactly what you're talking about. It's retirement, it's insurance. What happens if something happens? My exit strategy is I have it proper insurance. I'm getting a degree. I have additional skills. I can do other things. Exit strategies. Your whole life is exit strategies. But when you think that way, it doesn't seem that bad because you're giving yourself options. If any of you have ever been divorced or been in a wrong relationship, one of the things you look back on that, you go, how was I so stupid to get involved in that? But at the same time, I should have realized that and had an exit strategy. <laughs> Your whole life, I know this sounds black and white and cold. I live my life and I've been very happy and I haven't been a geek, is I've always had an exit strategy. If something happened in my life, I had savings, I had options because I was educated, I protected my children, I protected my real estate and assets, I had an exit strategy. Now, living like that can be sometimes overwhelming. So you have people to help you. If Eva sends me an email in two years saying, Mr. Hassey, I need help with my exit strategy. I know exactly what you'll be talking about and I can help her. You, that's what you need to think about for your own personal management. Don't depend on anybody else especially if you're a woman who gets paid less than men, which is the biggest travesty in the history of mankind, but that's the way society is. You need a strategy for yourself. Yes, you might have a partner, a spouse that cares for you and loves you. That's great. But you got to think about your own personal exit strategy. Then when you become an old gangster like me, you can enjoy life and not worry about paychecks, not worry about any of this stuff because you're educated, you've been up to date, you've saved, you've invested, makes life a lot better. That's my going away remark to you all. Exit strategy. Any questions? I will post this video to Blackboard. I will keep this Blackboard site open until 2024. So if you ever want to refer to it back, you can. After 2024, you have your YouTube playlist for this class. All the videos and stuff are there. So you have this is another resource for you down the line. Might mean nothing now, but in the future, it can save your bacon. Excuse the expression. It's been a pleasure. I'm sorry that sometimes this class has been rather weird with the directed study and not being in the classroom, but the sign of the times. But I hope you, this class is giving you some value. I hope you complete your course evaluations. I'm looking forward to reading your papers and I will post the grades 
early next week. And if you need anything, Unisa, you're on your own with my next class, sorry. But if you need anything in the future regarding academics, business, personal money management, please feel free to call on me. If you need a letter of recommendation for a job, it's always good to have a couple of professor recommendation letters in your own personal financial or personal uh, HR file. And you can say, hey, I, I took this class from Professor Hasse and this is what we learned. And he said, hey, this is the kind of job we're looking for. Maybe that this will help you. Trust me, get a couple of professors you trust and have them write letters or recommendations for you. It doesn't have to be now, stay in the future. I'll remember you. I keep track of everything. I know all my students. I might not remember your face, but I know I will remember your name. All right, ladies, it's been an honor. I wish you all the best. Stay healthy. This damn pandemic pandemic is still around. Be well. You know where to find me if you need anything. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed our course. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I do have a question about the paper. Yes. Um, so the topic that I chose was um, how does the high debt to income ratio and many open credit cards affect yes. your credit score? Um, but as I was doing research, high debt to income ratio, but income isn't included in your credit score. Did you mean like utilization, like how much you use? Yes, yes, exactly right. If you have, let's say, let's say you make $50,000 a year and you have five credit cards with credit yeah. lines of totaling $15,000, they're going to take a look at that and say, Poof, uh, that's going to affect your credit. Now, if you make $200,000 a year and you have five credit card accounts, that's so they don't, having a lot of credit cards is not good, but at least it'd be better because you're probably meeting all the uh, payments on that. But also remember, when you get credit, you have to tell the credit card organization how much your income is, right? Yes. They, in order to get the, so some, it, that's in the, that's in your information. That's out there. And FICO people get that information from the credit card companies. So okay. they know your income. They know your income. Okay. Do you have, because I was looking at like Experian and stuff like that to try to get more information on this. But from what I read was that they don't get that they don't get your um, income report or anything to be able to calculate that that's not included in it. So it was well, mostly like it's kind of yeah, Eva. It's kind of indirectly included when okay. they get when they get the payment report from your credit card company, and the credit card company tells Experian what's your credit line. Let's say your credit line is five thousand. Well, Experian knows if you have a five thousand credit line, the credit card company gave you that credit line based on X amount of dollars that they know you're making. Okay. So indirectly, they know. Yes. <laughs> does that so make sense? I, it does. On my paper, can I also talk about how your um, how much you owe, how much you use versus how much? Um, oh, perfect. Yeah. Um, what am I trying to say? How much you owe or, or versus how much uh, credit you have available? Yeah, definitely. To to see um how that can work out because I was trying to see how I can do that, but like you said, it doesn't really tell you that. Yeah. It's there, but even though it's indirectly, um, I guess assume that it is. Yes. Used. Yes. Okay. That that'll right. be fine, Eva. That's fine. Okay. Great. Thank you. This this the purpose of this paper for me is to make sure that you guys are all. Uh, be able to have writing skills and can interpret things. But for you, it's looking at areas that you're interested in that might help you down the road in understanding credit or in understanding insurance or whatever. So it, it serves two purposes. Uh, I'm looking for you to find any information that you feel is relevant that you want to know about and then write about it. That's important. Okay. okay? Yes. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All right. Anyway. It's been a pleasure. All right. Unisa and I'll Unisa and I will see you. Am I going to see you on Saturday, Unisa? Yes, I'll see me on Saturday. I'll see you Saturday morning then. Wow. All right. Thank you, ladies. Have a great rest of the summer. Hope to see you on campus one day. I know I'm going to see Unisa on campus. So take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.